bust that myth that we're all agree on everything. So what, yeah, what, that, actually that's a good question. Jason was going to talk about this. The question is what other things do free staters disagree about? Maybe talk a little bit about that. And it's interesting because I was having a discussion on Facebook after I saw your notes, which included a short list of things, and the person who I was discussing this with said, well, you know, there's this one issue, it's a very important issue, and, and I said, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, Jason was planning on talking about that. I think he actually skipped that line, but it's one of the issues uh, that there is disagreement about, and uh, probably in this room disagreement about, and that is the issue of abortion. Um, and there are several others. There are some that are on your list, and there was one that I thought of that's an, a legislative thing, which is kind of um, another one where free staters have worked on both sides of the same issue, and that is right to work laws. And you had a list, uh, included some others. What was on your list? Uh, also the environment. Right? So on one libertarian view, you should ban all pollution. On another libertarian view, no regulation. Right. Right? I yeah. think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, moral philosophy. So libertarianism is a political philosophy. It's not a comprehensive view of the good. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can be a virtue libertarian who thinks that there are lots of moral obligations you have apart from just not violating others' rights. You should be kind to people. You should, um, you know, you should take care of your body, right? These are maybe obligations that you have that go beyond just not violating others' rights. And then at the other extreme, you might have libertine libertarians who say, well, as long as you aren't hurting anyone else, it's fine. You know, um, uh, let it all hang out, so to speak. <laughs> and, I, and I think even underneath that is a, a uh, Maybe that sits on top of a idea, and that is theology. What is the theological persuasion? And that's another thing where there's vast disagreement. There are atheists, in fact, there are anti-theists, uh, not just atheists, but they oppose vocally the idea that there is a God, and there are theists, monotheists, polytheists, uh, deists, everything in between, pantheists, etc., etc. So there's a huge variety of uh, theological persuasions that people hold amongst free staters. I don't think, I suspect that not one of them is a majority, that there are no majorities as far as that goes. I don't know that. There's no data. But, but as far as issues, um, I, I like the right to work one because it's, it's um, an example of where do you, so it's a state law, right to work law is a, is a state law that's been passed in several states and been considered here. Did, we, did it pass? I don't remember now. No. It didn't pass. Um, <laughs> And it's an example I mentioned earlier about where do you start from? Do you start from scratch in your thinking or do you start from the status quo in your thinking? And it's an example of s starting from or at least accepting the status quo as a starting point, figuring out what can we do about that. So in that regard, I would argue that it's concessionary. I'm actually against right to work, personally, this is not a free state project opinion, but I'm against right to work legislation primarily for that reason. It um, has less to do with my views on on unionism, I've been a union member. I've also been an entrepreneur, um, although you know not of any kind of big, big businesses. But I, I do some investing in other business-related things, and uh, so it's it's not so much a, f a function of that, but of right to work being a band-aid on a federal law. So it's a jurisdictional argument. The federal government regulates unions um, and employers. They would have to, because that's the other side of that equation. And right to work is one of the few areas where states are able, I guess, legally to exercise authority. And so it says, well, you can't force union membership. But that actually undermines the rights of workers. And uh, the problem is the federal government to begin with. And so what we're doing is band-aiding that. There are other people who say, well, the workers um, should have the right not to join. And uh, union membership shouldn't be compelled. And the federal government's bad, and we have to do something about that to protect workers' rights. So there's two sides to that coin. I don't like putting band-aids on bad situations to begin with. I think you should cure the disease. Um, there is an, but there is an argument. But if there's a disease, you should at least put a band-aid on You should on at it. least put it, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So now go ahead and present your case. Right. Well, I'm in favor of right to work laws. Uh, Perfect. In the context in which the federal government has a National Labor Relations Act. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so, and that is the argument. And free staters literally worked on both sides of that legislation in New Hampshire, in the House as elected representatives. So I think that's a, a good example. Obviously it's less, maybe a little less controversial than abortion, uh, which is one that, you know, that's like the third rail or whatever. Maybe we should get into that here. Another thing where I've seen free staters and 
people that claim to be liberty-minded work on both sides of the issue is voting rights. Yeah. And I want to hear both of your perspectives as individuals, not as representatives of any organization. Yeah, yeah, and again, all of this discussion is, is kind of, now we're transitioning to take the Free State Project hat off, and because the Free State Project doesn't take positions on those issues, what do Free Staters think? Um, go, go ahead. <laughs> Voting rights? I mean, these are tough issues, and I'm not sure how I would vote on all the bills that come before the, the legislature. Um, you know, I'm in favor of it being relatively easy to vote. Um, I, I think I would uh, certainly vote, vote against any bill that would require a government ID to vote. I'm not in favor of government IDs in general, I'm not a fan of them, except for specific narrow purposes where they're absolutely required. Um, on the other hand, I probably would vote in favor of the one that says you have to be a resident for 30 days before voting, right? because that helps ensure local autonomy. So the Republicans wouldn't like me for the first one, the Democrats wouldn't like me for the second. And I guess I don't have a strong enough opinion to about those mechanical details. Um, I'll, I'll throw a little curveball into the question. It's about voting rights, and I would argue that we don't have the right to vote away anyone else's freedom. So uh, the subject of the vote is actually, um, in, in my mind, more important than the electorate. So now the electorate is important. Who, who gets to vote makes a difference, but what they're voting on actually makes a big difference to me. If you're electing a king, who is going to, by edict, rule everyone's life, I would argue you don't even have the right to vote on that. You can't vote away someone else's freedom. That's not a legitimate right. Uh, voting is a way to make a decision, presumably between alternatives. Sometimes it's just yes or no are the only alternatives, and other times there are many candidate alternatives. It can be an effective way to do that, but if the available decisions are wrong to begin with, then we have no right to vote for wrong. I would agree with that, too. <laughs> There was another one that just came to mind that you reminded me of, and I've, I've now forgotten. When you get old, your memory goes. Something somewhat related to voting would be initiative and referendum, which is something that New Hampshire does not have, but Colorado, Washington, Alaska, all states that Jason mentioned do have, and that's how those states wound up with the legal cannabis, or the taxed and regulated, but we're calling it legal. So the question is about initiative and referendum, and I guess the question is, is that good or bad? Is that the idea of the question? Your, your thoughts? Our th just our thoughts on initiative and referendum. Um, let's see, you went first last time, right? So um, it, it's good and bad. There are cases uh, where initiative and referendum has been used for bad purposes, uh, and there are cases where it's been used for good purposes. So again, it's a a procedure, a tactic, a method of implementation, and the real question is what's the subject matter? I don't think that um, the legislature has the right to vote for things that would violate someone's rights, and likewise I don't think that individuals, that is the citizens, have the right to vote for something like that. So a bill that comes before um, the, the public as a referendum should uh, be vetted to ensure that it doesn't violate people's rights, and that doesn't always happen. Uh, there are cases where it's been effective. One of the most, um, maybe most important cases is the California property tax cap that has uh, radically altered the tax structure in California. Another very important one is Colorado um, marijuana decriminalization. That was initiative and referendum. Also, I think Washington's was, right? Um, so there have been cases where it's been used for good in as much as that's the case. I think it's a good idea. Oh, yeah. there, there's one other thing, and that is that um, there's not an initiative and a referendum, but constitutional amendments in New Hampshire do go before a vote, right? I think this is correct. Yeah. That they, so the legislature sees these things, but then the people actually have to vote on constitutional amend amendments. So there is a limited issue there. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a risky institution. You can get good with it, and you can get bad. And so Florida had a lot of bad initiatives that got passed. I think even California's had some. Well, yeah, I mean, California's law uh, requiring labeling of anything that might contain anything that might cause cancer uh, has led lots of companies not to sell in California at all. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the question is, um, you know, is it, are the costs greater than the benefits? I, th I think the, the costs are greater than the benefits for a traditional initiative, so I would oppose 
uh, introducing that to New Hampshire. Uh, but I would favor introducing a citizen negative. And so the citizen negative would allow you to introduce an initiative to repeal a statute, but you cannot pass anything new. Um, so that, that would be a way for the, the citizens to get involved and, and I'd vote for that. keep the, the legislature in check. Let's have a referendum on that. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Rich. Um, on, the same, on the same idea as uh, referendum, one of the problems that I've always seen with democracy is if you can get half of the reps to agree to somebody, to agree to something, it gets imposed on all of the people. And it seems like if you could have a clear separation between what's a repeal of a law and what's passing a new law, and of course under current jurisprudence those things can be mixed, but if you had a clear separation and you said, okay, it takes 85% to pass a law and 20% to repeal it because <laughs> it's imposed on 100% of the people. I don't know if that's ever been tried, but it seems like an obvious, as a computer programmer, it seems like an obvious hack. If you're getting too much law, raise the standard a little bit. Um, has anybody ever tried to do that that you know of as a political scientist? Occupy Wall Street. So is the question is, is it does anybody, has anybody ever tried changing the standards for passing positive law versus repealing law such that it would take a higher percentage of the legislature or any other body to make new law versus a lower percentage to repeal existing law? And no one has tried it, and the reason, uh, one of the reasons I think is that it is, um, you have to very carefully specify what it means to repeal a law. So is it, can you just strike out any word in the statutes, in which case, you know, that could actually increase government. Well, let's strike out the word, you know, government shall not take private property. Let's just strike out the not. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, maybe you could say uh, you can, uh, to repeal a chapter in the statutes or repeal a paragraph in the statutes. We'd have to, you'd have to kind of look at how the statutes are organized and try to figure out, okay, what are all the un potential unintended consequences of this uh, to, to make it work well. Um, but it's a provocative idea for sure. I think there's an, another um, dimension to your question, and that is the, the dimension of some people decide and everybody is then subject to the outcome of their decision. And this is where there might be disagreements, going back to the, the question of disagreements among free staters. Um, there are some free staters who are anarchists, that is, they oppose um, any presumably involuntary hierarchy there are free staters who are, you might call minarchists or limited government advocates, which is there may be some hierarchy that is limited to the purpose of protecting individuals' rights to life, liberty, and property. And for now, we could let's lump them together into two camps. The anarchist camp would say that uh, simply there can be no subjection to decision that's not made by consent. So 99% uh, of the people could vote, and I, as an individual, could opt out. A minarchist might say, well, I might be bound. Um, and as would everyone else, provided the law or the rule does not exceed uh, the government's legitimate function of protecting individuals' rights to life, liberty, and property. So that's an area where uh, there would be disagreement among free staters. Any other questions? We'll probably wrap up here in the next couple of minutes. Or comments, or criticisms, or complaints, or praises, or anything else. Or praises. Did I mention that? Go ahead. So, I know you talked about how um, trying to separate, like how the Free State Project itself is they don't control their participants, their individuals. They all think it's fair. Like I wouldn't judge all Christians by how the West World Baptist Church. Is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but if there was a, like a church group here in Keene that then went. To to the Westboro Baptist Church and says, hey, well, I love the publicity you're getting. Like, come here and put our name on your signs. Advertise. Don't you think there's a little bit of responsibility there where they can't just say, well, we're not personally protesting soldiers' freedoms and having this, you know, spreading this hate speech. You know, God hates fans, and things like that. Like, you know, how much responsibility does the Free State Project have in who they're giving their money? So let me see if I can if I can summarize the question. How much so the Free State Project doesn't 
we, we already discussed doesn't direct its participants or there's kind of a conceptual separation between the FSP and what we as participants do. Is there any or to what extent is there any responsibility for any relationship between the Free State Project and I presume you mean the organization and um, and individuals or groups that it has some sort of maybe visible connection with is that is that kind of the idea either they're giving the FSP money or the FSP is giving them money or advertising or something like that is that the sort of the nature of the question do you do you want to uh, take your pick yeah so I think in a Westboro Baptist Church situation obviously that would violate our uh, policy against bigotry so if a free state or God active in Westboro style protests. I think we would remove that participant from our database and say, you know, welcome as a free stater. Um, obviously there has to be a, a kind of um, you know, range of, I think there's a, a range of tolerance that you kind of have to have for um, differences of opinion about ends and means. Uh, and there's a, a kind of limit frontier to that. And uh, I think it's plausible that the, the limit should be a little bit stricter for people that the Free State Project has a professional working relationship with as opposed to just individual Free Staters who sign up for the FSP. Right? So the vast majority of individuals who sign up for the FSP and move, they're not, uh, we're not doing anything for them as an organization other than, you know, showing them what New Hampshire is is like and providing them information. Um, and so we have a fairly relaxed standard that you have to meet. You know, as long as you don't have you know, violent racism, bigotry, uh, you're welcome. Uh, now for people that the Free State Project has a professional working relationship with, I, you know, I, I think there um, maybe it's worthwhile having um, somewhat higher standards and say, well, is, is this relationship going to work to the, the